Okay, welcome everyone. Um, this is, uh, thank you for joining us. We, um, we still have significant numbers of people coming in, but I think we're ready to get started. I'll turn it over to uh, Jen Green. Go ahead, Jen. Thank you so much, Mayor. Um, so as the mayor mentioned, my name is Jen Green and I'm the Director of Sustainability charged with supporting Burlington's transition to net zero energy in the thermal and ground transportation sectors. I'm so glad that everyone is here with us tonight. I wanna to thank you so much for joining us for what I know will be a rewarding and rich experience for all of us. Before we get started, I wanna welcome all of you as participants in tonight's discussion. I especially wanna welcome Burlington School District students and teachers who I know um, many, of whom are, many of you are with us here tonight. We appreciate your engagement and hearing from you on this important topic. I also wanna welcome and thank VCAN and VCAN members from around the state. For those of you who don't know, VCAN is the Vermont Energy and Climate Action Network, a network of over 100 VT volunteer town energy committees from around the state. VCAN is co-sponsoring tonight's event. So thank you, Joey, we appreciate that and appreciate hearing from you soon. Before I turn it over to Mayor Weinberger and Dr. Saul Griffiths, I wanna run through tonight's agenda so we're all on the same page. In a moment, I'll turn the floor over to Mayor Weinberger. We'll speak briefly about Burlington's electrification efforts and why inviting Saul can and will inspire us to strive for net zero. After the mayor speaks, Dr. Griffith will share his thoughts on why electrification is so critical to address the climate crisis and why his most recent book, Electrify, an optimist playbook for our clean energy future, and work at Rewiring America is so particularly relevant from, from a BED and Burlington City context. After Saul has spoken for 20 minutes or so, we'll launch into questions, including it, opening it up to participant questions. Our evening together will conclude at 6.15. So let me just tell you briefly about the mayor before we turn it over to Saul. As most of you know, uh, Mayor Moreau Weinberger has been serving for 10 years and during that time has been a strong leader in climate action issues. Most recently, in 2019, Mayor Moreau Weinberger set a strategic and very ambitious goal for the city to become a net zero energy city by 2030. Mayor Moreau Weinberger is a member of the Mayor's Climate Coalition and founding member of Rewiring America's Mayors and Municipal Leaders for Electrification Coalition. So Mayor Weinberger, I'm really happy to turn it over to you. Thank you, Jen. Thank you for getting us kicked off and all that you have done to lead Burlington sustainability work. Um, I am so glad that so many of you have been able to join us tonight from around Burlington, around the state of Vermont. And I, I think we even have quite a few, whoa, sorry about that, quite a few out of town uh, guests um, uh, joining us on the Zoom tonight. Um, that was a ceremonial skateboard that just fell down in the background there. Apologies for that. Um, for all of the out of town guests, uh, I, I do just wanna share a little bit about Burlington's context, uh, the context for tonight's conversation. Um, Burlington has really worked hard at the municipal le level to be an environmental leader since the late 1980s. Um, uh, that is when uh, the city began some very uh, ambitious, uh, weatherization efforts led by the Burlington Electric Department, our city-owned uh, utility, and we actually consume today as a community less electricity than we did in 1989. If the rest of America had followed that trajectory, there would be something like 200 less coal plants in this country uh, than there are today. Um, in 2014, after a decade of focus work, Burlington became the first city to source 100% of our electricity from renewable energy sources. And I was fortunate to be mayor when we got over that milestone, was there for the, the last push, and it um, had a big impact on the way we think about the future and led to us um, setting a new goal in 2016, which we is clearly our most ambitious goal yet, one of the most ambitious in the country, and that is to become a net zero energy city by 2030, which essentially means that we will stop using fossil fuels to power our vehicles um, and uh, our buildings, and that we will do that um, through electrifying everything, essentially. And we're off to a great start with this goal. We're trying to be very data focused with this. We are measuring every year our progress towards this goal. The first one of our uh, measurements came uh, about a year ago, 
and um, remarkably found that we were on track towards this, uh, this target with having seen very significant um, reductions uh, in our uh, fossil fuel emissions in 20, 2019 and 2020. We're expecting another update of those metrics fairly, fairly soon. Um, we also took a big step as a community just last fall when the voters of Burlington, 70% of the voters of Burlington voted yes on a $20 million net zero revenue bond, which is going to fuel our efforts to upgrade our grid and continue to make investments and offer incentives that will drive the community towards um, that net zero goal. However, um, we have a long way to go with this, and this is a community-wide goal. It's one that we're only going to reach if basically every household in Burlington and every business understands the climate importance and the financial advantages of electrification. Um, and if everyone here in Burlington is taking action uh, to electrify their vehicles and their buildings. The point of tonight's event, um, as well as an additional town hall that we're going to have next week and some other events later on in the spring and summer, is to raise the profile of this issue, to communicate how Burlington's efforts to fit into the larger national and international effort to address the climate emergency, and to make sure the community is fully aware of all of the ways in which the city and the Burlington Electric Department can help you make the electrification transition. And that is why, you know, I'm so excited to have Dr. Saul Griffith here tonight. He is one of the world's leading electrification experts. I, I feel like I've known him for a while because I've been following his uh, various podcasts and, and uh, national appearances. And I had the good fortune to meet Saul in DC last fall when I joined, um, became a founding member of Rewiring America's Mayors and Municipal Leaders for Electrification Coalition. Um, Saul is one of the co-founders of Rewiring America. He's also a remarkable engineer and inventor. Um, he was a founder and chief scientist um, at Other Lab, an independent R&D lab, and he helps government agencies and Fortune 500 companies understand energy infrastructure and deep decarbonization. He's the author of the books Electrify and the Big Switch, and you know, something that uh, is a great, uh, great um, uh, acknowledgement, a great uh, achievement. He was recognized in 20, 2007 as a MacArthur Genius Grant Award winner. Saul, we're so grateful that you're joining us here tonight. I know it's not your first time kind of visiting Vermont, um, but I know many people have not had a chance to, to hear your thinking yet. And we're, let me turn it over to you. Um, thank you very much uh, to the mayor. Thank you to VCAN for having me also. I understand your sponsors of the event. Um, really, honestly, thank you, Mara, for the leadership you have shown. So um, as I'm, I'm going to talk about, I'm going to try to, well, I'll give a caveat to everyone. Uh, I got COVID a few days ago, so I'm a little slower than normal. Um, I've had to crib from a couple of different presentations, so hopefully I can weave it into a good story. If I fog up a little bit, hopefully you understand. Um, to tie COVID to climate, thank God I was fortunate enough to get COVID after we had vaccines developed. Um, so it's now treatable and relatively mild. Um, and I actually think a lot about electrification now is the vaccine we need for climate change. We know it works. We know it's the way to get to zero emissions. And if we all keep to a vaccination schedule, we have hope. And that's why Morrow's commitment to um, net zero emissions by 2030 is actually commensurate with the climate science, which is very rare. So I congratulate you for that. And um, congratulations to Burlington for being the first US city to get 100% renewable generation commitments. That's great. Um, so with that, uh, here I'm going to try to weave a new narrative that I think is really important about the climate transition, which puts communities, cities, neighborhoods, suburbs front and center in this uh, critical global transition we're going through. So 
with that, I'm going to share the screen. Hopefully someone can provide feedback that the screen share works okay. Okay, you should be seeing a big yellow rewiring America. Good. You see it. Anyone? Uh, you're good. Fantastic. Yeah. Thank you. I just wanted confirmation before I launched into a monologue. All right. So I found an organization called Rewiring America with a colleague called Alex Lasky. Um, and its goal is to really help communities and help countries uh, decarbonize on schedule for one and a half to two degree limiting warming to one and a half or two degrees. Um, and we're doing that in a number of for forums, including hosting an electrification caucus in the US Senate, um, mayors for electrification roundtables, and working as closely as we can with communities. So quickly, I think it's really important now that we have to talk Turkey on climate to put actual real communities in the climate perspective. So some of you will have seen this chart, this is from the SR15 IPCC report. This is the emission reduction schedule we need to be on for trying to stay at a one and a half degree world. Fast and early emission reductions are vital because it's a cumulative problem. So if we delay by 10 years, we'd have to go down this green pathway and actually use far more negative emissions. And it's probably not even possible. So this these 2030 targets are now critical. And I'm starting to try and think about this. How do we now show you that this is really what we need to do in communities um, to get the first and the easiest reductions? Um, close to two thirds of our emissions around the world happen in households and small businesses with the things that we do every day. The hardest emissions um, that we still don't necessarily have technical solutions are the industrial ones, steel and cement and other things. So they're the ones that are going to happen later on this chart. But that emphasizes the need for the things that we know how to do, um, meaning households, small businesses and communities, we need to do first and we need to do fast. This emphasizes it even more. There is your schedule. And then this actually talks about real machines. We've got to electrify our, our heating systems. That's our water heaters and our space heaters. We've got to electrify our kitchens to get ourselves off gas and we have to electrify our vehicles. These are the natural ages. So water heaters last about 10 years, kitchen equipment 12, around 12, space heaters around 15 and cars around 20 years. That really means not that you have to go out tomorrow and buy an electric vehicle, but you need to be planning now that when the uh, gasoline car that you bought a few years ago retires, you need to replace it with electric. Next time you replace your water heater, you need to be ready to replace it with a heat pump, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We need to be on a perfect 100% replacement schedule to hit these targets now. So what is the case for electrifying everything? And really, I think the case is a case for economic renewal and about redefining infrastructure about the things in our homes and our communities. And I think it's, it's really a great story about community economic renewal. It's not um, news to any of you, carbon crisis is really an energy crisis. Around in the US, 87% of our emissions from, are from energy, and that's from burning the coal and the gas and the oil on the left. So that's what we need to focus on. 42% of our emissions emanate from the decisions you make around your kitchen table in your house. What fuel goes in your cars? What heats your house? Where does your electricity come from? Fortunately, in Burlington, it's all renewable now. And how are your... Um, how are your fuels made? This expands to 65% if you include small businesses because in small businesses, they're making the same sorts of decision. What fuels their cars? What fuels do they use for cooking and heating? And where does the electricity come from? So our homes are our infrastructure and we need to electrify the end uses. This is a typical American home today running on gasoline, all of their vehicles and all their toys, running a huge number of things on natural gas from our heating systems to our hot tubs, to our ovens and stoves and water heaters. And we're still, well, maybe not for you, but for most Americans still getting their electricity from coal and gas. 
to achieve zero emissions, true zero requires electrifying the demand side machines. And that's a simple statement that there won't be enough biofuels to power all our vehicles. Hydrogen is really an electrification strategy anyway. Our only path that we actually know works to get to zero emissions is electrification. Demand side machines machi means the machines in your life, and then we have to supply them with clean electricity. That looks like this. That means we'll need a vehicle charger in every home or every building, electric vehicles on the streets, electric hot water, electric furnaces, uh, electric cooking, solar on the roof, uh, and batteries to back it up. And that's going to be a critical component of the clean electricity supply that includes solar, wind, hydroelectricity, and, and probably in North America, some nuclear uh, power as well. The amazing thing about this electrification, it will more than halve the energy use for real people without you shrinking your home, without you shrinking your cars, um, while also improving your health, improving your quality of life and lowering your energy bills. Why is that? This is because electric machinery is just fundamentally a better technology. If you drive an electric F-150 instead of a gasoline powered F-150, it'll use less than one third of the energy of the petrol car. So we used to have a strategy in the US based on efficiency, which was an idea born of the 70s energy crisis. And efficiency makes things a little bit better, but you can't efficiency your way to zero emissions. We need to do electrification. Same is true for your water heater. If you go from a natural gas water heater, you could make it slightly more efficient. However, if you go to a heat pump hot water heater, it'll use about one third the energy of your gas water heaters. Same is true for space heating, a half or, or two thirds of the energy that you're currently using in natural gas is eliminated when we go to heat pumps. Same again for cooking. In fact, electric cooking uses about half the energy of gas cooking. All of those add up. Um, the other thing, of course, that makes a huge difference is close to 60% of the energy that is that goes into these power plants on the left that's coal that's natural gas is lost as waste heat when we generate it with wind and solar we don't have all of that energy waste all of that really adds up which is why the american household will more than half the amount of energy it uses as you can see on that picture it was a picture of supply versus demand supply is where we get it from demand is where we um, use the energy we did this modeling for um, the Senate. You can clean the grid without electrifying the end uses. It gets you about halfway to your emissions reductions. You need to also electrify all the end use machines if we really want to get to zero. And so this is a statement that we can't just talk about the big things, getting rid of the coal power stations. We have to talk about all the little things. We know this because we looked at all the details. This is an incredible map that I'm going to quiz the audience on later about every energy flow through every system in the US economy. Um, just joking. Um, but looking at that has given me a machine level view of the US energy economy, which I think is a, the best way to translate the story of climate to what we have to do in our own communities, in our own homes. On the supply side, it's a small number of giant machines that last about 50 years. These are the coal plants, the natural gas pipelines, um, the oil refineries, et cetera. There's about a million of those machines in the US economy. On the demand side, it's a huge number of small machines that last for around 25 years. Your cars, your water heaters, your kitchen appliances. It's about a billion machines on the small side. Traditionally, climate policy lived over on the supply side with large corporations and large machines and their lobby groups. I think the revolution we're about to be riding is that the demand side is where Americans live and the decisions that determine the quality of their lives, the cost of living and the majority of their emissions, emissions live over on the demand side. And finally, we can enable people with a story of their, how they can contribute to climate solutions in a way that also benefits their household. Households are also a logical place to ground the conversation because the household there actually connects to the transportation sector through your vehicles, to the commercial sector through how you source a lot of the things that come into your household and to the industrial sector that supplies the fuels that come into your household. 
Here's the challenge for America. There's 98 million space eaters that are running on gas still. We need to replace those in the next few decades. There's still 117 million water heaters that are either running on natural gas or low efficiency electric. They need to be upgraded to heat pumps. We have 220 million household vehicles that need to be um, upgraded to electric vehicles in the next 20 years. 95 million gas stoves, ranges, ovens, grills, and cooktops that need to be upgraded to electric in the next, you know, as soon as possible. 20 million gas dryers are still out there that need to be upgraded. And to enable all of that, we're gonna need other new household infrastructure that's gonna include at least 50 million, uh, if not 100 million rooftop solar installations, at least 30 million household batteries, new breaker boxes or switchboards, and a vehicle charger for every home at least to help charge all of those cars. That's another 400 million enabling machines. Just to put that in perspective, that's a billion machines. That's a half a million homes that need to be cleanly electrified every month for the next 25 years, or roughly we need to upgrade one of these pieces of machinery every second for the next 25 years. And that's how we hit our climate targets. That might sound intimidating, but remember, we're going to be replacing all of these machines anyway. Um, and also remember that doing the installation and those upgrades is going to be probably the largest driver of jobs in the US economy that we've seen since World War II. Um, so that should be reason enough alone to do it, the, the, the climate reasons and the schedule, but here's a story about the economics. This is the average household spending in the US about $61,000 a year after they've paid their taxes. Around $2,000 a year is on gasoline, although that's probably gonna go up to 25 or 100 or $3,000 a year this year um, with what's happening in the Ukraine. Around $500 on heating fuels, which is more than the average household spends on dentistry and around $1,500 on electricity, which is more than the average household spends on education. And over here on the left, it shows you that the worst hit are the lowest income houses. So for the highest income, 10% of houses, it's only about 3% of their expenditure. Once you get down to the, the lowest income, 50% of houses, it's, it's close to 10% or more of the annual expenditures. So they really stand to benefit if we can do this transition right. right. I'm talking to you today from Australia. Um, and uh, I have lived a lot of my life in California and I do work on climate and energy really now in Europe, in the US and in Australia. And I think you can now firmly say that um, the future already exists. It's just not one in not all in one place. So this graph tries to tell us tell you what is the possibility if we align policy, regulations, uh, and technology correctly. So from Australia, where I sit, Australia has achieved what they call the rooftop solar miracle, where solar on the rooftop installs in Australia at $1 per watt. After financing, that leads to a cost of electricity at that household of five to six cents per kilowatt hour. That's probably a third of what you pay from your grids in the US um, and that is something that literally is just a regulatory difference between Australia and the US. So with regulatory wins in the US, you could be having that price. That enables delivered heat through heat pumps uh, where Jap Japan, Korea lead the world in heat pumps. Um, so if we could take the Australian rooftop solar uh, experience, the Japanese Korean heat pump experience, combine those. Also, the fo rapidly falling cost of batteries, which we project could be installed as low at $100 a kilowatt hour by about 2025, 2026. Combined with that, the clean grid that's happening in the US and Europe, where solar and wind are now three to four cents a kilowatt hour. And really what California and the US is, is leading the world on, which is electric vehicles. Um, and by 2025, it's broadly thought that they will have the same price up front at the, at the showroom floor as gasoline vehicles. Once you make that sort of best of Australia, best of California, best of um, 
Japan and European policies all exist in one place, which is possible, we would be realizing in every American household savings of on average two and a half thousand dollars per year on all of their energy bills. And we could look up here and we could find Vermont. You actually stand to save the most. That's because you drive a little more and you heat a little more. And in fact, it would be about three and a half thousand dollars per year per household every year in savings in Vermont by 2030 if we get onto this electrify everything um, program. And particularly if we align policy, finance, regulation, technology in smart ways. I'd really like to emphasize that we can't leave any household behind. Um, it should be obviously true to anyone in the audience that you don't half solve climate change. If only the richest 50% of households can afford it, we're in trouble. The problem ultimately is going to be a credit access problem. Um, I'm convinced that the economics of these will work out, but will people be able to borrow the money for the upfront capital cost? Will people be able to afford the electric vehicles? Will people be able to afford the heat pumps and the solar cells? And that's going to be a question of, um, you know, innovations in the sector. So can we do rate-based financing for some of these upgrades? Can cities step in to help? Uh, and honestly, we need every idea that we can get to make sure that every time any person is replacing their hot water heater, the cheapest, easiest to install solution is a heat pump. Every time a family needs to uh, get a new car because the old one retires, how do we make sure and help that family can afford and get into an electric vehicle and there's sufficient charging in their neighborhood to make it possible? This is a slide from the small town where I'm living in Australia. Um, and I think this is what is really exciting me now on a personal level about thinking about community be benefits of electrification. So this is actually the average household in my town. They spend $4,872 a year on fuels right now. Rather like Vermont, I suspect, um, or Burlington, when you spend $3,393 on gasoline in my community, it creates maybe half a job at the local um, petrol station or a gasoline station. Um, and the rest of the money just leaves the community immediately creating no real employment. $300 a year goes to natural gas, which leaves our, our, again, leaves our town immediately, $1,000 in electricity, which leaves our town immediately. However, there is about the, the early signs of success are coming, about 25% of households now have solar on their roof. Some of the money for that capital leaves town, obviously, some of it leaves for finance, but actually that creates $20 in labor jobs per year per household and around $2 in energy savings, that's today. But if we use those numbers I just showed you for what happens where the technology trends are going, this is the amazing story for the household. So we'll be zero of the money will be spent on oil, zero on natural gas, zero on this coal. We will still be purchasing clean electricity from out of state and out of town. But we will be investing in these electrification machines, uh, the CapEx and the finance, but will now be per household $336 in labor per year, saving $4,000 a year on the energy cost. That might be about $3,000 a year on energy costs in Vermont. Um, and think about that for our community, that means every house will now be spending close to $5,600 a year in the community. Imagine, you know, we like buying local beer as, as someone in, uh, in Vermont uh, was quoted recently, why shouldn't we be buying local energy? And in doing so, um, not only local energy on the supply side, but sort of the on, on all the components of the system and think about that community spend. So that's good for the household and that $5,000 in community spending is good for the community. Let me tell you the story of my community. We're about a thousand households. Uh, and so 
those savings, what that will mean is every year for those thousand households, three and a half million dollars a year will not, won't be leaving the community to buy oil and gas. It'll be three and a half million dollars a year that'll create in our thousand household community about 12 jobs for contractors doing the installation and maintenance and about 50 induced jobs in the community because those community savings will be spent buying local beer, local books, local produce. Um, that's an even more incredible story when you think about Burlington as a town, for example, 20,000 households, uh, that's likely 40 to $50 million a year in savings that will be creating hundreds of local Burlington jobs. And I really think about, have been thinking about this concretely in terms of my community, but I think you probably can immediately see the benefit for, for Burlington and, and in fact, cities everywhere in America and around the world, 40 to $50 million a year of spending in Burlington, Vermont, you, you, you literally can't buy football fields and new school classrooms and library books fast enough uh, at that rate of saving. It, it really, this project really could be the project that America has needed to do local community economic renewal um, for decades. And I, th I actually, this is where I have optimism um, for the US and for the world, because we're gonna start to realize that addressing this climate problem is a spectacular way to address real quality of life issues and improve our local communities. Um, just I'll end on this slide and uh, I have no idea how long I've spoken for, but hopefully there'll be plenty of time for questions. Um, this is how I'm hoping that we start to think about our communities uh, and our homes within our communities. This is what you'd like to keep as our, our tracking schedule. So I made these for my community. I'm hoping someone from Burlington, Vermont, perhaps Murrow will uh, contact me and we'll draw these schedules for Burlington. But how do we get in my community from 30% rooftop solar to 100 in the next 20 years? How do we get to 100% electric vehicles in the next 20 years? How do we get to 100% electrified kitchens, a smarter um, breaker box or a switchboard, electric heating, electric hot water, community renewables to also provide some of that cheaper electricity and uh, home batteries? I think this is the type of template we need for not only for Austin, me where I live, not only for Burlington where you all are, but for every community in America and every community around the world. And this is how we're gonna hit our climate targets. <coughs> so thank you for that. That was, uh, that was awesome to see. And uh, thank you for persevering through this, even though you're, you're, recovering from, uh, from COVID. Um, the, uh, we, we've got a lot of co comments and engagement in the chat already. And one question that I've seen and that I've heard you speak about in the past, and I think it um, adds very significantly to the, what I find to be an incredibly optimistic uh, view of the future that you just laid out there, or optim potentially optimistic view and, and one that, stands in really stark contrast to a lot of the a lot of the discussion about the climate emergency which is so often kind of uh, framed in the in the kind of uh, disasters uh, and, and the, the perils that we face uh, you start to paint you, you you're painting an economically advantageous future I I know you believe that there are other ways the future will be kind of more awesome and better um, if we move towards electrification as well and from health benefits to uh, <clears throat> uh, other improvements. Could you speak to that a little bit as well? We know in America that, um, in fact, the American Medical Association, if, you're, if you report to a doctor with your child with symptoms of asthma, the first question they will ask you is, do you cook with natural gas and do you use natural gas to heat your home? We know that the chief cause of respiratory illness in children and adults is the burning of fossil fuels. We know that communities that are downwind from coal and gas powered stations have are cancer clusters. So the health benefits here, which are hard to quantify in dollars, but easy to quantify in morality and, and emotionally are going to be enormous um, 
for America. And really, we, sh we should be doing this for that reason. It's interesting. Um, I've been living with electric vehicles in my life for a few years now. And, um, you know, in my childhood, I strangely enjoyed the smell of gasoline. But it's interesting, once you've don't have it in your life very much because I never haven't visited a petrol state, a gasoline um, dispenser in a year or, or a few years. But when I smell a car that's burning on, cause I'm stuck in a parking lot or something with a, a gasoline car is like, Oh wow, really? That is a toxic, horrible thing that we're doing to our lungs every day. Um, and it's, it's, it's interesting. It's like when you, you know, you know I think we're all going to have this awakening when, as we make this transition, like, Oh wow this is good and everything's quieter because we're not, you know, there isn't constantly an engine running somewhere. Um, so, you know, I think there's, there's going to be huge ancillary benefits from, you know, the qu literal quietening of our communities and we'll be able to hear birds again to improving quality of our health in, in nearly every way. The, um, Thank you for that. Certainly been my experience as well as an electric car driver now for many years, even, even on less uh, consequential levels, it's just more fun to drive electric cars uh, than, than alternatives. Oh, yeah, maybe I see maybe where your question was going now. Um, I'm going to be really honest to you. Uh, I actually think the whole of the U S the whole world needs to have a little bit of a mea culpa, like, you know, I'm guilty too. And I will now share with you that I am indeed guilty too. Um, I own a 1963 Land Rover that runs on with a Brazilian diesel tractor engine. I own a 1961 Lincoln Continental. I own a 1959 dune buggy. Um, and I, I really, I don't love what cars have done to the world, but I love the machine. Um, I'm currently electrifying all of those. Uh, I just did a 5,000, mile road trip in an electric vehicle they're faster um doing silent donuts i think you know i think the way we win the culture war is just like you know i'm going to tow my electric jet ski with my electric truck to the to the lake i'm, I'm gonna do donuts in the car park i'm gonna silently um jet ski around the lake much faster than you on your horrible two-stroke that makes your child smoke as they're being you know cough as they're being towed behind the boat breathing in the barely burnt petrol um like honestly the, these things are going to be faster higher performance you know cooking with an induction cooktop it took me a number of years to get one into my life my wife and i both had psychological barriers to it but like once you put it in it cooks faster it cooks cleaner everything is, is better about it. Like we really have a lot of things, uh, a, a lot of things to win here. And we should, we should just fight back with the culture war with like, you know what, you like your diesel truck, try dragging, drag racing me in my F-150 electric. I have some uh, hope that, that that is starting to happen. I mean, it was awesome to see on the Super Bowl this year, uh, so many electric vehicle advertisements and, and, and you know, including those for the, the, Ford Lightning. Um, I uh, I know that a bunch of our DPW uh, street workers are, are are looking forward to uh, the electrification of our, our our truck fleet in the city that we that we that we've started on. Um, you know, I think that's a, another really good example of how it's it's playing out differently in every country. I think Europeans are now like, oh, it's about our electric heating systems. Americans are going to be bought into this future on the back of their electric trucks. And Australians are bought in on the back of this unbelievably cheap rooftop solar where now in many communities, half of the households are enjoying electricity that's one third of the cost that they were paying previously. Like, every, you know, it's going to be a different journey everywhere if we just got to make this all happen in one place. <laughs> we, um, you know, we're just on those price comparisons. We're, we're now, you know, since... Uh, since the war in Ukraine began, we're now looking at over $4 a gallon um, gasoline pricing here in, in Vermont. Um, I, uh, I, I'm, I'm, I've been asking our team to put up a, a sign that looks like a gas sign on, uh, next to our electric department, um, showing that the, uh, if you come to a Burlington Electric Department charging station, you can refuel your car for the equivalent of about $1.60 a gallon. 
And if you uh, are a residential customer and you sign up for our off-peak uh, you know, overnight recharging, um, we're down and under 70 cents a gallon. And we're trying to advertise that comparison on, on the radio right now as well. You know, it's huge. We did those numbers for the US in 2020. Um, I did numbers for Australia in 2021. I just re-ran the numbers in Australia and the savings to the household by 2030 went up from $5,000 a year to 7,000. And that's all due to the increase in the price of gasoline. Probably means those numbers I just quoted you for Vermont of three or three and a half thousand dollars is probably four and a half or five thousand dollars a year now. I like to express it in pennies per mile. Um, if you're driving your electric truck powered by rooftop solar in Australia, it's about two to three cents a mile. That's compared yeah. to your at four dollars a gallon, you're paying 25 plus cents per mile to drive your truck. Wow. So um, that saves that that's that's it there. Like right? the cost of a shower is you know an eight minute shower is about 60 cents running on gas if you're running that with a high efficiency heat pump with some blend of local solar and and grid renewables it's going to be less than 30 cents for that same hot shower right it's going to be these everyday activities and everyday savings that hook us and then that again emphasizes how do we make sure that we bring the whole community along to enjoy that and all those numbers, of course, uh, I, I think, right, are before you even properly price fossil fuels, before we have in place uh, some kind of appropriate carbon pricing for the pollution. Uh, you know, one thing we're working on right now, and, you know, I hope we have some state legislators on the line with us tonight, is we've asked voters here in Burlington have voted for the authority uh, for us to be able to regulate um, locally um, our the, our, our buildings in terms of uh, thermal regulations and, and putting in place, uh, starting with new construction. I think eventually perhaps, you know, I, I do think eventually we have to uh, put it in place for everyone when they're looking at replacing water heaters and whatnot, like you were saying, we, we want the ability since the state won't do it and the federal government won't do it yet. We want the ability to essentially put a carbon tax on fuel consumed uh, within Burlington. The voters supported that and um, we have, uh, we got it through one, one house of the legislature, uh, so far we're, we're hoping the Vermont Senate signs off on it in the coming days and then the governor approves it. Um, uh, you know, I think these numbers get even more consequential when inevitably it's taken too long, but when we get to properly pricing carbon. You know, um, what that really makes me want to emphasize is that we need cities to be the crucibles of these innovations. We need lots of experiments. If we're very honest, practically no individual household has figured out how to do this, let alone a whole city. Um, and we could lose this fight in a death by a thousand paper cut sense. And what do I mean by that? There's been a hundred years where the fossil fuel companies have We've designed our building codes to support fossil fuel infrastructure. We've designed our rate structures. We've designed our, um, our rules of our utility and distribution grids. Um, we've designed federal subsidies to support fossil fuels. We need to eliminate all of those things. And, you know, the reason Australia pays a dollar a watt compared to three dollars a watt in the US for solar is not because our salaries are lower, our wages are lower. Um, it's because we eliminated red tape. I know some people call it green tape, but then I get confused whether it's red or green tape. But, <laughs> um, you know, we still have building codes in the US that are based on the fact that you, if you burn natural gas in your house, you need a fireman to be able to climb on the roof with an axe and punch a hole, which means that they put a setback on the side of the roof that you're not allowed to put the solar cells on, which limits how much solar you can put on your roof. We, we have arcane laws like that that need to be undone. We need our building codes to be updated. Um, and we, we, we really need to think about this uh, regulatory work in a whole system whole, uh, sense, because if we optimize it all, we're going to realize those savings. Uh, if we you know continue with dysfunctional conflicts between the national electrical code and the local building code on how you install a heat pump, we could lose the benefits here. It's tough, detailed work, but we're, we're trying to do it here. 
Um, I, I want to just point out one more thing, get your thoughts on one more thing before we turn it over to, to questions from others. The um, Jordan from my team is going to put up a graph. Now it looks a little bit like the graphs you were showing there at the end, although uh, I would love to, you know, we got a big punch, bunch of the BED team here that I'd love to follow up with you after and, and do more of the analysis. Um, we are, this is a graph if, if it, if it renders momentarily here, hopefully, that um, shows what happened when in the middle, in the early months of the pandemic, we put in place what we call the green stimulus incentive, which um, was a major uh, new incentive from the electric department, um, which is, and I have seen a question in the chat here, it is, we are lucky here in Burlington that the city controls the utility, the, 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 the city owns the utility. And I do believe that makes it possible for us to um, lead in this area. I think it's a big part of the story why Burlington has been leading for, leading for 30 plus years. Um, the, we, we announced in, I believe it was May um, of, the, of 2020, new incentives for uh, heat pumps and a whole number of other new incentives, but the heat pump adoption uh, change was, was the most dramatic. You can see how the adoption rate has changed since the, um, the introduction of those incentives. You know, we still have a, have a long way to go. That's, you know, 500 households out of something like 20,000 uh, uh, addresses here, households um, and businesses in the city, but it's a start. Um, and no, I think that, that's extraordinary. I just did some quick math. Um, that means it's going to take you close to 60 years to eliminate gas locally, but it's a fantastic start. And you've, you know, what you're really like that uptick in that curve is incredible. Um, and, you know, let's just uptick it a tiny bit more and we're on target. So here's the, here's the thing. What I don't get is, um, like these incentives are not handouts. These aren't government subsidies. These are uh, these are discounted prices essentially from our electric utility that is trying to sell more electricity and trying to secure more customers. And we have seen it's not just uh, city-owned utilities that have done this in Vermont. We have a very pro progressive and provocative uh, privately-owned utility, um, Green Mountain Power, that. Uh, has been making similar um, changes and really pushing uh, to, for the industry to change. But I, I get the sense this is unusual in America and an unusual is not what most utilities are doing. I don't really understand why the profit incentive for American utilities hasn't kicked in and people, they aren't trying to grab a bigger market share of the energy dollar and you know fight with the oil companies for, for market share. Um, I don't understand either. If you build a basic model of what happens to a household when you electrify or what happens to a community is you're going to need about 250 to 300% of the electricity you use today. So if I was a utility executive and I'm like, oh, that you mean my business is going to grow by 250, 300%. Um, that's incredible. They should go after that. There is still, however, a lot of conflict in the US because many utilities are split fuel utilities where they're like, oh, but if I do that, I lose my highly profitable natural gas business. The, but you know, this is now starting, that 300% growth is starting to look more profitable than natural gas. So I think they will come around. Um, honestly, going back to how do we make this benefit the consumer the most, I think we even need to revisit the, um, in the very early days, of the electricity system in the US and around the world, the electricity grid was owned by cities. And cities were motivated to make good decisions for their customers. In the middle of the 20th century, they mostly rolled up and got regulated as the state regulated um, entities. And I actually think we lost a lot in, in that. And now when you buy electricity in Vermont, you're sending it you're, or in, you're sending, you're buying electricity in Burlington, you're sending it out of your town to the utility upstate or utilities out of state. Um, I actually think this is the argument for 
doing as much as possible of that load growth of that 250, 300%, how much of that can we do in community renewables projects, whether that's community solar, you know, let's have an argument of whether the solar should go on the school, the church, the town hall or over the car parks, uh, community wind, community hydroelectricity. Um, the more renewables you put in your community, that will be the cheapest of all of the renewables because you eliminate the transmission and a lot of the distribution costs. Um, I actually think we should, not only do I not know the answer of why they are not fighting for it, um, I'd like to say we should also probably have a little bit of an uprising and try to change the rules of the grid that we wrote in the 20th century that favoured giant centralised infrastructure and, and rethink it for what's really coming down the line here. Awesome. Well, 250 to 300%. I, I think our BD engineers have to start recalculating. I think we're planning on like a 60% increase uh, in, the, in the coming years, but uh, we, we, better, we better recalibrate yeah. based on this talk. Um, I want to get other people into the conversation here as well. Uh, Jen, Johanna, why don't you take it from here? Yeah, thank you, Mayor. And Saul, thanks. That was very, um, that was really inspiring. And I think your book is aptly named. You start with the word optimism in the title. And I think uh, there's another plug. I think uh, it's important for us to be optimistic. And I, you know, I'm thinking especially, Mayor, about the students that are listening in tonight. There is this sense of eco-anxiety that I'm hearing about among young people. It's important that we to collectively sort of look positively toward the future. Not only some of the policies that you've implemented in Burlington, but the technology, the incentives and the rebates that BED is offering, I think can offer us a, sen a sense of, and, of hope and optimism. Um, I do I will, want- can I, can I make a little admission? Please. Uh, as an author, you don't get to choose the title. You ah. get to write all the words in the middle. And MIT Press came back with, we'd like to call it an optimist play, playbook. And I said, I'm not, you know, I'm not sure that I am an optimist um, because I can see like everyone, I'm looking at some of the questions in the Q&A. Yeah, there's a, a lot of reasons to believe we could screw this up. But I started to try and own the word optimism given that the MIT Press had given it to me. And I actually, I've developed a curious sort of Churchillian optimism. Right. I've done a, after the failure at Dunkirk, <laughs> Churchill had just been beaten, you know, the Britain had just been beaten back by Hitler in France. And that was the origin of Churchill's, we will fight them on the beaches speech, which is actually very serious about a very grim topic, not unlike climate change. But the optimism is like, it doesn't really matter that it seems futile and impossible. The only possible way to win is to fight them on the beaches, to fight them on the streets. And we have to have the optimism that we can fight the whole way here. And any sort of defeatism or non-optimism is in some respects rolling over and, and not joining the fight. We, we just have to win this with, with that Churchillian optimism. Yeah. And Thanks for that. We're, we're with you um, in Burlington with that and this effort to embrace the optimism despite the hard fight. There's really no other path forward. Um, this is all I, well, I do just want to note there are a lot, there's a lot going on in the chat, as you can see. Um, I do want uh, Johanna Miller, who's here again. Uh, Joey is the coordinator of VCAN. VCAN is a co-sponsor. So I do want uh, Johanna to have a chance to ask some questions, not only of her members, but what she's coming through um, in the Q&A. Um, so, Johanna, let me turn it over to you to, to ask some pointed questions. Thanks, Jen. And thank you, Dr. Griffith and Mayor. This is great. And we're going to fight in communities, Saul, too, because we have this amazing leadership that's happening in Burlington. And there's, you know, half the towns in the state of Vermont have these grassroots town energy committees that are working with their municipalities and working with their community members to you know really push this transition. And we got a lot of questions beforehand. We have a lot of questions in the chat and in the Q&A. And I am gonna to try to get to as many of them as possible. Some are for you singularly saw, saw and some of them are from or for directly the mayor and some are for both. But I also wanna ask, ask some, and I also wanna make sure that Saul, especially if you have, a, or Mayor, if you have questions that you want to make sure are answered, I wanna get to those as well. Um, so starting first with some of the questions that we got earlier, 
Um, one thing that people noted, um, Dr. Griffith, you haven't uh, raised the rewiring America's push to electrify for peace. And clearly that is a big thing on top of people's minds with the what's happening in Ukraine. Um, so the geopolitical energy crisis, can you just speak to that a little bit um, and just put that on people's radar so we know what that is briefly? Um, electrification for peace is the, you know, the majority of gas in Western Europe. In fact, Western Europe really has no natural gas. So it heats itself and powers its industry with Russian natural gas. And so electrification for peace is to recognize that the same storyboard that I just told you that works for America is really the recipe for particularly Western Europe to get off um, Russian oil and gas as fast as possible. Um, but, you know, we, should, we could extend that to all countries of the world who are sending a lot of money to not terribly good petro states um, all the time. I think there's not a, a huge amount more to be said than people can read in the public media. So, but I maybe will give you one little piece of insight, which was fascinating to me um, and an interesting comparison. So in the 1970s, when we had our first energy crisis, there was the first calls for energy independence. And that was because 15% of US energy was being imported as oil from overseas. And that was a huge concern. Um, America is going close to achieving energy independence now in one sense of su supplying all the oil and gas and electricity it needs. But um, we don't count all of the energy that Americans use because we also purchase a huge number of things and there's energy embodied in all of those products. And in fact, close to 15% of the energy that Americans use today isn't accounted for under the Energy Information Administration. It's energy imported in, we, we run a trade deficit, if you like, in energy and energy imported in foreign goods. And in fact, close to 3% of the energy used by Americans is Russian natural gas making. And, you know, I don't mean to offend you, but Audis and Mercedes and Legos and Ikea furniture in Western Europe that is then purchased and bought in America. So that's to show you just how deeply intertwined these international trades and energy flows are and how they really relate to the geopolitics we're seeing in the world today. And it really emphasizes the need to very quickly electrify so that we're not, you know, paying the enemy to fight us in wars. Couldn't agree more. And I think that's very true in Vermont where we import 100% of the fossil fuels that we use. So there are several questions related to the affordability and really helping lower income earners um, sort of electrify more. And one specific question was, what kind of electrification strategy might be appropriate for those who live in mobile home parks with old wiring and 50 amp main breakers for each home? So there are several threads to the questions related to, again, how do we make this more affordable for people? And how do we help lower income earners sort of make the investments that they need to electrify more things in their homes? I think this is uh, not only a huge topic, but probably the most important topic. If um, we are already seeing it, all of the fight back from the fossil fuel companies is on cost of living, and they're trying to drive a cultural wedge between those who can currently afford to decarbonize and those who can't. So unless we quickly make this affordable and achievable from everyone, we're going to lose a lot of time in the fighting over the cost. Um, Curiously, mobile homes use slightly more energy per square foot than non-mobile homes, but they are significantly smaller and in a per occupant sense are actually much more energy efficient than uh, current um, single family homes that are standalone. And in fact, you know, electrifying and decarbonizing your mobile homes is, is somewhat easier and uh, a lot lower cost because it's a smaller space to heat and, uh, and a whole other facts, number of facts like that. Um, I'm sympathetic to that. I think it's close to 8% of 6 or 8% of households now in the US living in um, mobile homes. Um, we, we have to do that. It's really becomes a, a credit issue. 
right? So let's talk, speak to some of the elephants in the room. If you can, you know, 10 or 20% of households can afford to buy one of those imported Audis or Mercedes that I just talked about. If you can afford to buy an Audi or Mercedes, you've made a very poor economic choice because if you instead bought an electric Hyundai um, or an electric Chevy Bolt, the amount of money you have left over would pay for the solar, the battery, the heat pumps, everything else. So you're, you, you know, the top 10 or 20% of households can already afford to do this and are just making poor consumer choices, horrible choices for the planet that are not making to do it. The next 50% of the economic spectrum probably can afford their, you know, 60 or 70% of Americans are living in, stand, uh, you know, own the mortgages on their largely standalone single family homes. And on the refinancing of those properties or when they move and they get into a new property and they do renovations, they can finance the costs of all of these upgrades. And so you can start to see sort of the 50, 60, 70% at the top end can afford to do this, but we, we really don't, we're not extending the credit far enough down the line. We don't really have solutions to make sure that renters are seeing the benefits it passed through to them. Um, and we don't have answers. I, I won't purport to having all of the answers. We have teams at Rewiring America thinking about this every day. Um, one, one of the people, Sam Kalish, who works for Rewiring America is a renter and he's just done the most extraordinary um, retrofit of his own life, including put, sitting an induction cooktop over the top of the gas in his house and doing a whole bunch of other things that have helped him go zero emission as a renter and see some of the benefits. So we're starting to see that it's possible. This is to say we need a lot more thinking on this and we need a lot, a, a lot more answers. And, and honestly, this won't happen without regulatory work getting done. This won't happen without financial innovation and, and probably won't happen without public private partnerships um, between cities and states and financing institutions. Again, to go back to one of the slides I show, you know, we have to make the right choice for every house, the cheapest choice, the easiest to get a contract to install every time their hot water heater fails or their, you know, their gas furnace fails. We know in the US today, you know, if you're most hot water uh, heaters fail, um, and 40% of the households that they fail on are under financial duress at that moment. And so they're motivated to buy the cheapest, easiest thing they can get tomorrow because it's probably the middle of winter. Your partner's probably pregnant or your partner is sick and you have to make a shrewd economic choice at that moment. You can't, you call five, if you call five contractors, probably all of them are going to say, no, doing a heat pump installation is too hard because I haven't done one yet. And so you know, at the very, we've got to really think from those purchasing moments back and like, okay, how do we make sure that the next time someone in one of those mobile homes, their water heater breaks, that we have done the workforce training, we've got financing at point of purchase in place so that when they walk in to get that thing replaced or when they call the contractor, the contractor's like, okay, I've got the latest heat pump model, I've talk to Murrow and he's providing city-based financing under XYZ scheme. Here's where the rebates are. Um, it'll be installed in, in six hours time and your shower tomorrow will be hot, right? We, we need to get to that place. Um, I don't have all the answers, but I know where the goalposts are. Very much appreciate that. Mayor, you've been doing a huge amount of work <clears throat> on the equity component too. Do you want to speak to any of the, any of the pieces that Burlington is leading on here? Um, I would. I mean, we certainly don't have it all figured out either. We're having those kind of discussions um, about uh, how how do we make sure, you know, for um, all households uh, that we are ready for those moments when people are making those investments. I will say uh, a couple of significant things that are starting to move the needle that we're hopeful about. We we are offering more generous um, incentives for low and moderate. Uh, uh, income customers, and we've gone from almost no, none of those incentives flowing to low and moderate income households to about 15%. Um, uh, now, uh, getting to those households, we are, um, after you know those decades of weatherization efforts, we persistently did not 
we're not reaching about 40% of the rental units in Burlington where the renters paid for the utilities and where the property owners had less of an incentive to uh, take advantage of all these sort of carrots that were out there to, uh, to meet, to upgrade air sealing and insulation. Um, we have now moved to requiring all our rental properties to uh, put in that um, you know, basic cost saving uh, uh, air insulation and uh, air sealing uh, you know, interventions. Um, one other kind of interesting uh, change that has evolved is in, in part out of this effort to try to meet a broader range of households is that we are now offering incentives for Burlingtonians that buy used electric vehicles, um, not just uh, new vehicles. And, and um, that's sort of broadening the group of households that we're, we're serving. But we got a lot of work to do. I, I, I think that, you, you know, the way you talked about there, Saul is exactly right. We, we, we are, we need to be meeting people in the, we, we can't be missing those moments um, if we're going to get, uh, to these goals over the next 10 years. Um, we, we are trying to advertise online, digital advertising for, um, you know, when people are Googling around for electric vehicles or heating systems, um, we're trying to uh, advertise in a way that will, that, you know, will pop up on their screen, the electric option. Um, clearly more regulatory action is going to be needed as well. And that's, you know, why it's so important that the legislature give us the authority uh, to make these changes at the local level. Here, here. And two questions related to that. Both of you have spoken to the regulatory and sort of policy frameworks that are gonna be necessary to the degree you wanna pinpoint anything more clearly about what exactly we might need to do, especially because so many of the folks on this call, you know, students, local energy committee leaders, leaders in, the, you know, their professional, worlds. Um, we want to partner with you, Mayor. We want the communities to partner with the state of Vermont. What can we be doing, those of us who want to support you and want to rewire America in a strategic, equitable way, Dr. Griffith, what, what would, advice would you give those of us out there in the world to set the stage um, to make this happen in Vermont? Um. Pick one, there's so many things to do, pick one thing and do it very well. And uh, I just saw an old, dear old friend of mine, well, she's not very old, but she's a dear friend of mine. Lisa Cunningham is in the chat and she has been working very hard on changing the rules over building codes for retrofits um, to make sure that anytime somebody is, you know, asking for a permit to do a building project where that is a significant retrofit that it doesn't retrofit with yet more gas. So she's made that her issue and is, is having quite a lot of success in Massachusetts and beyond. Um, we need similar efforts to make sure that there's sufficient electric vehicle charging infrastructure. We're going to need 10 to 20 community vehicle charging stations for every thousand households. It's going to make an enormous difference of whether they are at the school parking lot, at the church, at the public sporting fields, or whether they're on a corporate campus. So we need people to be lobbying that they are appropriately placed in the communities. We need... Why, why do we need so many, Saul? I'm surprised we need that many, given that like 90% of the recharging happens at people's houses. We, here's, here's a bit of a problem. Um, we looked at a lot of the data and um, the, the tragedy today is that um, we've got about 5,000 vehicles we've been tracking for about five years and people treat their electric cars like their cell phones. So they drive them home, they park them on the bed stand with the cell phone and they plug them into charge. And unfortunately that means we're charging our electric vehicles at the times of day that are not necessarily correlating to when the wind is blowing and the sun is shining and the hydroelectricity is pumping. Um, so we need to change some of that behavior and that can be changed if you put the vehicle charging at least some proportion of it where people spend their hours during the day. And that's in the community in workplaces, in shopping centers, at schools, et cetera. Um, and I think that's, uh, so we need, it's, it, this is really a yes and issue. We need this as well. Um, just to give you one more example of, you know, I'd love someone or maybe a few people out on this call to take up this issue. 
um, the way we structured the utility monopoly in the 20th century motivates the utility to take the full uh, distribution charge that they currently charge for distributing your electricity, which is just so you know, two, three or four times as high as the cost of generating that electricity is the cost that they ma manage the local distribution network with. If they apply that to all of the new 250 or 300% of the transactions, um, that significantly increases the cost and, and hampers the economics. The reality is that the local distribution grid can in fact handle this 250 or 300%. You have a hundred, most American homes have a hundred amp uh, load center in them. A hundred amps at 110 volts is 11 or 12 kilowatts. Even if you have two electric vehicles in your house and electrify everything else, that house only will need about three to four kilowatts of constant power. So there's enough room providing you can move and manage the loads around um, on all of the local wires. So we need someone to proactively make sure that the rules, and this means, you know, it doesn't sound like exciting work, but this, you know, you want to know where the front line of this battle is. The front line is showing up to your utility regulatory committee hearings every month and kicking up a stink. So we need five or six well-motivated citizens to show up to represent at every one of those hearings to say, well, we have a cartoon model of what the future has to look like to fix climate change. And we don't want you to ruin it or hamper it with these rules that you're going to try and write to favor the existing system um, and represent for the community and represent for the household. This, okay. I mean, I could go on and on and on, but we need, we need a soldier in every one of these fights. So Saul, I'm the lucky winner that gets to play timekeeper. And I, it's such a shame that we don't have more time. So I think we're going to have to take, you had a comment in the chat. You've been invited to come back or come to Lake Champlain to uh, kite ski. So we hope that you'll do that. Um, <laughs> Thank you, George Warner. I know he asked that question. <laughs> you know, this is the beginning, I hope, of a long sort of conversation. And Mayor, so happy that you are directly involved with Rewire as a founding member of the, um, the municipal and mayor's coalition. So we know that this is one of many conversations that we'll get to have with Saul and Rewiring America more um, generally. I do want to thank Johanna for, for helping out with the questions. And I, again, sorry we didn't have enough time. But we're nearing uh, the end of our time together. I know, Moreau, you wanted to say a few sort of parting words and, and thanks all personally. Well, um, thank you, Jen. Thank you for, again, for, for your leadership and, and you, all the work that went into making tonight possible. Uh, Saul, very, very grateful that you've joined us. This was uh, everything I hoped the conversation would be. And um, uh, I, 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 I do hope we can, can stay in touch and there's a way that Burlington can continue to help with uh, the movement that you're building. Um, I, uh, you know, my last thing I just wanted to say is um, I, I didn't get to answer Johanna's question. What's the one intervention? Uh, the one thing that I, I I would hope people would advocate for. And to me, it always is um, clearly the one, the single thing that is a policy choice that could happen before the end of the session this year, or won't, but it could happen before legislators adjourn in Montpelier, it could happen tomorrow in Congress, um, is we could put in place uh, some kind of revenue neutral uh, carbon pricing, some, some kind of way. Right now we are having those battles on the beaches, in the towns, uh, and we are having this fight with one hand tied behind our back. There's just uh, it, it, all of the interventions that Saul just listed would um, happen faster, would have more energy and force behind them um, if we we're properly uh, pricing the cost of pollution. We've done this for other pollution here in America. It works. Um, uh, it, it is. It is. It is um, what is going to drive. What is finally, I think, going to uh, really uh, make a difference um, in accelerating our, our fight. And it's a good segue to, to the, the final thing I have to say tonight, which is I hope people will consider coming back and joining us for the next Net Zero Energy Town Hall next Wednesday. Uh, it's going to be at the same time, uh, 5 p.m. I believe the logistics are very similar. Correct me if I'm wrong, Jen, in terms of how people you can register and, and sign up for a link. 
We are going to be joined next week um, by uh, MIT uh, professor uh, who has pioneered something called the, uh, seems like a mouthful of a, of a name, but it's called the En-ROADS Interactive Simulator. Um, but it is, I've seen it in action. It is a pretty remarkable um, tool for um, showing what the impacts of various innovations uh, interventions are in getting to those go goals that uh, Saul featured early in the presentation, you know, that show we have to do so much work over the next uh, next 10 years and how early interventions really matter. Um, we'll have a chance to do this uh, together with audience participation, putting in the various uh, different interventions. The one that to my eye, when you plug it in, has the biggest impact in part because it drives electrification so significantly. Um, is the introduction of some kind of uh, revenue neutral um, carbon price. So um, I don't know if it's possible to drop any information into the chat as we depart here, but I hope people will consider uh, coming back for, for the next town meeting next, uh, next, next Wednesday, um, April 6th at 5 p.m. Anything else about that, Jen, that I failed to mention? That... No, that's great. They can register on your Facebook page. Great. Saul, do you want to have any last words? Uh, one last word, one last comment. Thank you, Mara, Mayor of Vermont or Burlington, for your leadership. It's really, um, it is astounding. We need more leaders like that. People of Burlington, you are lucky. Um, on the fossil, on pricing some carbon in any way, uh, you know, I'm going to set the bar even lower. That would be great. But can we just stop subsidizing fossil fuels? And this was painfully brought into focus. Yesterday, Australia released its federal budget, which included $11.6 billion in subsidies for fossil fuels. Most of that will immediately leave the country to pay for foreign oil. Um, curiously, we did the calculations on what it would take to electrify the 10 million Australian households by 2030, to do so would cost you $12 billion and would lead to savings by 2030 of $40 billion a year. So by continuing to subsidize fossil fuels and be, unfortunately because of the fight in Ukraine, there's a lot of people who now want to subsidize fossil fuels for a few more years, which sort of seems like a good idea, but it just isn't. Um, we, we should be focusing all of that money on electrification, decarbonizing households, which is the technology that's ready to deploy today. And, you know, we can do it. We just have to think clearly and we have to demand for those clear thoughts to be heard and implemented as policy. Awesome. Thank you, Mayor. That's Sorry, that was a rant. <laughs> no, it's uh, <laughs> totally, totally with you there. Thank you. Um, Thank you everyone for joining tonight. It's been awesome. I know we didn't get to uh, all the questions in the chat or even close, uh, but thank you everyone for, for participating uh, so actively and um, look forward to uh, continuing this conversation um, with you all uh, next week, if you can join us then. Have a good night, everyone.